Hey, B-Size Detroit, how's it going today? Uh, I'm Alex Fernandez Gotti, and uh, I'll be here speaking about pen testing, what they do not teach you in school. So uh, I've given this talk once before at Eastern Michigan, so for the students in the crowd, it's maybe a little bit repeat, but hey. Um, so how this is going to work is, you know, feel free to speak up and say something at any point in time. I, I realize I'm a professional, but I'm not an expert. I'm a year into this. So if you guys hear or see something you don't agree with, I want you to speak up. So there is one exception to this rule. If Beltface comes into this, con this room today, he has to show up some dance moves before he says something. So be sure to call him out on that if he says something. So a little bit about me. Um, I graduated from Eastern Michigan University in 2010 uh, with a Bachelor's in Science of Information Assurance. Uh, my focus there was penetration testing, ethical hacking, uh, network security. So um, I am currently a pen tester at TrustWave Spider Labs, uh, security analyst, entry level there. And uh, it, in our statement of work, it actually says we're contractually obligated to be world renowned. So that's why I keep my head shaved. So I do have a background in IT. Um, and I have been heavily involved in various InfoSec groups since the age of 16, whether it be Michigan 2600 or different IRC chats. Um, I, I've also been trying to get involved in the mentorship programs to be somebody who's mentored by somebody rather than be uh, a mentor myself. So during school, um, went to class like we all did. You know, went, uh, went there, learned what we had to learn from professors, passed the tests. But I also went to conferences, which not everybody did. Um, it was a, kind of a failure in the academic, their academic institutions to not encourage students to go out there and engage in other parts of what might be their career. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Like go ahead, just speak up. Right, and that's a problem. Right, absolutely. I completely agree with that concept. Uh, people should be getting involved if it's truly their passion. So, uh, but that's, that's kind of what this goes into here a little bit. So, um, I also got directly involved in making things happen on campus, whether it be setting up a new network environment, a new lab, uh, a new testing scenario. I, I wanted my hands in there. So, um, I would go ahead and, and push forth and say, hey, I am going to be that asshole that says, I'm going to do it. So, um, but during this process, I still didn't really have an understanding of what penetration testing was, even though I very much wanted to be involved in it. Um, I really thought pen testing was this. I'm the guy in front of the screen with the glasses on, being some elite asshole. So, um, as I moved on, I graduated. So, what the hell? What do I do? Right? Crap. Um, so, I put my resume out there and got a hit within a couple weeks and ended up in Kansas City, Missouri. When you're 27, Kansas City is not where you want to be. So there's really nothing to do, but it was a great job, and I had learned a lot, and I learned, I had a lot of fun. Um, Boulevard Brewery out there is pretty good. If you haven't had a Boulevard beer, check it out. So um, I moved on from there. I was rather ambitious and wanted to move up to uh, something else. So I became the network engineer for the Detroit Tigers on a five-month contract. Um, problem with contract jobs when you're new in the industry is after the contract, what do you do? Well, nothing. So that sucked. But I kept on putting myself out there, getting involved in Twitter and InfoSec groups and conferences, and ended up eventually talking to somebody at TrustWave, really like March 13th, really kind of a, 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 it was far away from when I actually got hired. So I'm sitting there hoping I'm getting hired, hoping, 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 and nothing happened. And so I had to keep on going out there and put myself out there and kept on doing conferences like ThoughtCon. Um, at ThoughtCon, I decided, hey, there's no after party, so I'm going to organize one. It's where I met other people in pen testing and got a bit of a lesson in life when it comes to that. And uh, that lesson in life actually led to a phone call, which led to an interview in which I did my research and realized that pen testing and such is more than hacking. Metasploit's cool, but that's really about that much when it comes to pen testing. So, and same thing with system design and analysis and major network deployments. This is really not security. This is only a fraction of it. So, but I, I was only just learning this stuff. I, I didn't really know, and I, I said this in the interview process and said, hey, um, this is what I think it is. Correct me where I'm wrong. So, I got hired, 
and there I am, a little red circle, and a group of about 100 different Spider Labs people, way smarter than I am. And I, I walked around, my day one is at DEF CON 20. They hired me, they flew me out, I walked into the training room, or uh, the, the dinner, and said, hey, I'm new. They said, yeah, right, go ahead, get out. You don't belong here. Um, then Rob walked up, said, no, really, we just hired him. He's not trying to soldier engineer his way into free food and drinks for the night. So uh, then I started going to the parties, met people, uh, idols, people I looked up to, rock stars. And this is when it became a little bit disillusioned. Uh, InfoSec rock stars are just doing the job, like anybody else here. And I realized that they may know some things, but technical skill is only part of it. So if you try and apply technical skill in certain areas that doesn't work in, you know, you end up in situations like this. So it may kind of apply, but it's probably a square peg, round hole kind of situation where you're going to have to force it. And what I really learned is penetration testing is more of this. You're more of a consultant. You're more of a people person. You're a business person. You have to go in there and you have to listen and figure out what your clients need. And nobody told me that in school. Nobody told me that going into the industry. That was something I realized after my second kickoff call where the client said, you know, what are you really trying to accomplish here? And I said, well, I'm going to try and hack your stuff and give you a report that says how I hacked your stuff. But uh, the, I kept on learning and growing. And eventually I realized you also have to really get to know your peers and your clients, first name basis. Uh, get to know you know, who these people are, what they want, what motivates them. Not only are your peers going to help you out and lift you up when you fall down, but your clients are also your clients will also um, lead you on the path of what you have to do, when you have to do it to make them happy and come back as a client next year. Which kind of brought me to you have to be prepared for anything in pen testing. <laughs> so. Um, Generally, my day-to-day -day when it comes to pen testing is, you know, I get an e assignment email. So this client has been assigned to you. You have 40 hours. It's an internal pen test. You are to basically go in there and hack them. Um, they'll stay whether it's for PCI, HIPAA, or any other compliance standards, or it will be uh, just generalized pen tests. And uh, I love the generalized pen tests because the gloves are off. So I'll reach out to the client. Hey, you know, I'm Alex Fernandez Guy with Trustwave Spider Labs. I'll be your pen tester. Um, I will attempt to compromise your domain, um, and I will do so in a professional way that will make you happy. And so we have the call. Uh, we talk scope, ranges, the blacklist, stuff they want me touching, and requirements. If it's for PCI, if it's for HIPAA, if it's for some other compliance standard, which my company may not cover, but they would like to have something to help them in that realm. And so the engagement begins. And we'll start doing, I'll start with recon, passive listening. Uh, capture hashes off the wire when they're trying to authenticate to machines via SMB or um, other authentication protocols. I'll then begin active scanning, um, actively engaging workstations or servers with open shares, see what they come back as, see what I can access without authentication. And then I try and figure out what those boxes do. So now I've got a ton of hashes and I crack them. And I then log into those systems and dump more credentials from there, hopefully finding a local admin or a user which has access to other machines, which leads me further up the food chain within the environment. Um, all along this process, I'm gathering more documents and more information, bearing in mind what my client has told me is important. And what's important there is, again, the listening skills. You have to figure out what they really want. If they want me to look at health, like healthcare data, cool, that's fine. Do they want me to find if their boss is unencrypted pen test reports? And I found those. Um, do they want me to figure out if somebody's peddling porn from their workstation? I can help out with that, that sort of thing. But it's all what the client wants. I'm in their home turf, and I have to respect that. It's not my opinions or my desires. It's theirs. So um, part of that process is documenting everything, because that eventually brings the end results, the deliverable, which is the reports. 10,000, yes? What do you use for documentation? Um, I know everyone kind of got stuck in strikes, but it's pretty easy to get gas. Or, uh, if I learned the script wrong, then nobody ever got it. <laughs> That's very true. People do not document enough in any industry. Um, personally, I use a lot of notepad, to be honest, a lot of notepad and screenshots. 
So, for example, if I come across um, or I have I've found something that's led me to domain administrator or a workstation with a, a lot of sensitive information, I'll stop myself, even though I really want to continue going down the rabbit hole, and I'll figure out, I'll, I'll write down what I did to get to this point, the host name, the IP address, um, whether or not an exploit was used, and if, if so, what exploit. Um, if not, what user account allowed me access to this and whether or not that user account is, is really provisioned for it, if they have permissions for it, um, or if it's probably just an open access group where it shouldn't be for the sensitive area. And so in regards to the report though, that all information has to be there. You're not writing a 50 page, here's the vulnerabilities, here's the stuff, it's useless to a client. If you give them, here's the, here's the narrative, here's how somebody could walk in, here's how somebody could do this or that, that's more valuable, I feel. But not just the one path I took to successfully do it, but you just stop yourself, you go back five steps and you start over. And in school, I was taught, you know, you start and you finish the job, move on to the next job. Well, if I got DA by doing NBNS spoofing, captured the hash, cracked the hash, got into the DC, Created a domain administrator account, and that's cool. Um, let's find another path to do it, because a pen test shouldn't be just here's your one path of escalation. It should be multiple paths. Otherwise, they pay 20k for one answer. So, and you really do have to. The reports are, are really where it comes into place. And coming from a technical background with a technical degree, nobody taught me how to write. So I uh, had to learn a, a lot of grammar skills, a lot of, uh, wh what the hell is a semicolon used for? <laughs> so I don't really know, but uh, if you deliver gibberish, I mean, it's useless to them. So like uh, this, this slide, some say the ball's never actually thrown. You walk into a client, you hack them, and then you're like, yeah, here. Oh, wait, pocket, no, you don't want to do that. Just, just speak up, Moe. Alex, I have grammar issues as well. Is there anything you can give me? No. You don't want to ask me? Um, I did find some online resources. Sorry? Your local community college. That's a good idea. Seriously, I mean, English 1, English 2, we're, as a, we're so bad at it. We're so bad at it. Yeah. Yeah, a French and English degree? Yeah. Find a manager that you can trust. Yeah, I mean, nothing's going to teach you about how you need to clean up your language. And, like, watching someone rip apart what you've written and rewriting yeah. it something that's just 10 times better and eight times better. Yeah, I mean, if we're professional. I completely agree. Uh, or you, sorry, go ahead. Practice. practice, but how would you actually practice if you don't know how to compare community, community colleges? Yeah. So other. And that, that's that's it's a really important skill. That I mean, who in the professional world really knows how to write other than like a, a marketing person or with an English degree? With an English degree, I am seeing somebody getting called out in the crowd here. But um, yeah, that's, that's, I, I would love to have just a person dedicated to correcting my grammar. But I would have to have time <laughs> to do that. So, yes? Right. I think it's a very valid point. However, the problem with pen testing is the loss of information is very confidential. So if you, I go off and hand a pen test report for a major, for a Fortune 50 company to somebody who's not vetted, who's not inside the pen testing world, I don't know what they're going to do with that. That's a security problem that might occur. Well, that's why you would get an administrative system. That works for you. That's the person who works in your company for you. That's what they used to do. They were your secretary. It's a valid end point. Like so I do too. <laughs> Which is, that's my concern with it. If I hand off a pen test report to somebody that doesn't know how to practice security, when the pen tester comes to my company and compromises their box, 
well, there's 10 pen testers reports right there for 50 clients. And that's where the concern comes into play. But they're not going to say something. They might accidentally leak information. So do we have technical people continuing the problem, queuing reports? Or do we have English majors, people who know what to write, people who have skills that we didn't bother with uh, come in and do this? I, I, I would prefer somebody to come in and do this. But <laughs> yeah, it would make my life easier. But um, it, the report really is just a culmination of a, a, a bunch of me going into the network and touching things and figuring out what worked. And so whether it be our spoofing attacks where I compromise, or not yeah, compromise, I, I get 15 hosts to start running the traffic through me. This is one of my normal every day. I step into a network. Day one, I'm doing ARP spoofing. I'm looking for people to start filtering the traffic through me. If the client's using a proxy, for example, I'll get domain creds because they're authentic to the proxy, and then the proxy is hooked up to the domain controller, Active Directory, and lo and behold, maybe I got the domain admin, maybe I got somebody in HR or finance, Cool, I'm going to log into their box and dump all the financial data. But I'll keep on capturing these hashes um, and go through, and then I'll send them off to my crack box, and I'll, comp I'll crack them. And by the end of the first day, I'll have a long list of usernames and passwords, which I have also a, a, a list of which workstations they came from. So and that's part of the documentation process, you know, understanding where what came from or what came from where is, is rather important. So you're not just throwing creds against something that's not valid for it, locking out an account, um, which makes things messy. And then the end result, hopefully, um, more than likely, you'll find a local administrator in one of these boxes. And this local admin stored in land manager hashing, which is incredibly easy to decrypt, will uh, end up being the local admin for every single workstation across the network, maybe even the domain controller, ending a complete compromise. And so that's, that's generally the easiest process for in, when I engage in a client. There's a number of attacks I do use, including uh, LLMNR, uh, Link Local uh, Multicast Name Resolution Protocol, which is built into Windows Vista, Windows 7, and Windows 2008. And what it does is it, it's uh, another step in the whole, I'm going to find something for you. So you type out a domain, goes to your host file, goes to DNS. And in Windows XP, it went to um, NetBIOS. Windows Vista, Windows 7, Windows 2008, it goes to LLMNR, and then it goes to NetBIOS. So all these boxes come with LLMNR enabled right out of the box. The install is just, it's, hey, we're going to use LLMNR before NetBIOS. So people turn off NetBIOS, but neglect to turn off LLMNR. And what occurs is I get a crap ton of hashes from that, which makes my life very easy. Um, and then, of course, go and crack them. Um, ARP spoofing is also one of those really uh, critical skills that you have to figure out the right time, the right place, and how to use it correctly. So you have to build a filter out to capture only traffic for the certain ports you're looking for, um, and then go through that to uh, in, in, in a very small doses on the network. So if you have 1,500 hosts, you're going to do 10 hosts at a time. It might take forever. But you're making sure the network's not impacted in the process. And that's, that's really important for the client. Say, can, uh, you know, back in school, ethical hacking? Yeah, absolutely. Just, you know, let's enter cap the entire subnet. That's cool, right? No, uh, that's how, you know, incidents occur. Sev1 incidents, especially at a hospital or a major financial institution where 254 hosts just went down. So, oh my God. So, um, but primarily, I fall back on my administrative skills. Um, that I did learn in school. So the exploitation, the knowing when to use it, becomes another tool set that my admin side knows, or then takes over at some point. So I'll log into a box. If I didn't know how to use Windows Command Line or Windows PowerShell uh, or uh, shell scripting, I would be useless in those environments. And so basic administrative skills make for a good pen tester, in my humble opinion. And I would actually like, if, if somebody has a differing opinion at this point, I would love to hear it. So, nobody disagrees on the administration skills? Okay, good deal. I'm glad to hear that. Um, but primarily, I think something we all have to push for in our peers and in our subordinates and ourselves is truly getting involved, going to conferences. I know you guys, you're here. You're besides it's right. We're all having fun, right? So, but other conferences like ThoughtCon, DEF CON, Nauticon, um, and hopefully someday 313Con, if we transition over to that. 
Um, just push out yourself out there, push your name out there, learn people's names across the world, across the country, and you'll learn a lot of stuff in the process. You'll have resources anywhere in the world. You can go and say, hey, you want to get coffee? Um, or a shot of Jameson, so cheers to that. And on that same token, like getting involved as professionals, getting involved in the CCDC, being a red teamer, or getting involved in GitHub, hopping on the IRC channels, or going out to meetups in your local area. I realize we're not all from Detroit, so um, there are DC groups all over the place going into your office and saying, hey, person in, sitting next to me in the cube, why don't you come with me? Building that group up so we get a security mindset pushed out to a, a majority of people instead of a minority. So the more we put ourselves on people in regards to security, the better off our industry will be. And so uh, on that same token, you know, asking questions, um, teaching people how to listen, and also acting as if we all know doesn't really work when it comes to interpersonal communication. It only works in social engineering engagements. Don't pretend. If you don't know, you don't know. So, and further, you know, podcasts, um, blogs, books, and truly the most important thing is mentorship. So if you're involving yourself in, in local schools, in uh, local meetups, find that kid, that 16-year-old boy or girl who doesn't know what they're doing, doesn't know how to run shell scripts or even look at them, and take them under your wing. Step up. So some of us have been doing this for 20 years, and you can tell by the gray hair or lack of. And uh, you guys need to be taking, out, taking those kids on your wing, the high school kids, the middle school kids who don't understand, who don't understand that hacking is going out and attacking China while it's cool might get you some trouble. But loading up a lab or providing them with the equipment for the lab or providing them you know, a VPN over to your lab, that would be incredible, an incredible opportunity for them. So, and uh, just for a point of reference, that's James Banfield. Um, he, was, he was the leader of the Education Insurance Group at Eastern Michigan University, and uh, he is whipping one of our interns into shape to get him to load up server rack. So, so this is my contact information, but in all seriousness, just to let you know I'm not a troll here, I really do want your opinion and your feedback on this. I want you to know what you think, what we can do as a community to reach out to everybody involved here, to prevent people from walking into pen testing and going, what the hell is this crap? I have to be a business guy? So what are your thoughts? What are your opinions? Speak up. We, uh, you know, we both went to Eastern. What do you think some of the good classes that all schools should be adding outside of English? I mean, the fourth person I've heard talk about writing at this conference so far in English in this office. I think it's really amazing. Okay. What other sorts of classes do you think should be added into that conversation? Um, being only a one-year-old in this industry, I'm not... Uh, entirely certain. I, I feel um, better researches, researching would be uh, advantageous. Um, understanding the research process that comes with writing, it's a basis, or it's a, writing leads to doing better research. Um, I also think uh, more diversity in your skill set. So if I'm going to school for some administration, cool, let's do some networking or some shell scripting or some development. And I'm not just talking like Java 1 and 2, I'm talking Java 1 and 2, shell scripting, and you know some archaic language, which is just difficult to get your mind working. So I think those skills would be useful. And as we all know, programming is just another language that we have to learn to speak. DT? So uh, you know, I, I come across when I see these kids, I talk to kids in college, and they say that they're all about uh, Linux, they're all about Windows. And I, I wonder what your thoughts are on getting a, a, a wide array of like fundamentals underneath your belt before Well, yep. Yeah. Increasingly aware of them all. If you're going to be in the industry at some point, you're going to have a cut to all of them. So you should get yourself to be as familiar with them as you can. Yeah. Or how we can get kids to think that way as opposed to, well, this is a Windows computer. This is a Linux computer. Then yeah, I've encountered those like people in classes at Eastern. They're like, oh, if this was on a Linux machine, I'd totally be getting this. Well, it's not, so get over it. I think that's an error of youth almost, <laughs> uh, you're, an error of experience. They're, they're not there yet to truly understand the value. So they, they de become dedicated fanboys, or girls. Um, that being said, breaking them of this is kind of like, uh, you have to throw them into a different environment. So if you're an educator, and the person is completely focused on Windows, 
Well, make them boot into Linux on their workstation. So have a multi-boot environment. Um, make them do their work in a Linux environment. Yes? You made a comment out oh. there. Nobody really responded negatively. You said that you thought that the temptation that the good, good systems in the basement so the good notes in the basement so are key. Most of the people here in this room would definitely it appears we all agree. But there are situations in the industry, especially in, in some schools, where they're primarily teaching people to be ethical hackers at the innovation centers and forgetting about the fact that you can't be effective in that industry unless you understand how systems administration is done, how notes administration is really done. Those key, those two entities need to coexist and within that individual that you're doing. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. And being blindly on the assumption. So uh, I think the particular, now I have no experience in another university except for community college in Auburn Hills. So um, the way th I think if you, if you create an ethical hacker out of a university, you're robbing them. It, it's important to teach them skills outside of penetration testing or hacking. You need to say, go take this 2003, 2008, 2000, you know, possibly 12 now, um, server admin class. Learn how to be a good server admin first. But I, I do think that everybody in here agrees with that at this point. Um, I haven't heard anybody saying anything otherwise. So you've had your hand up. Again, just speak up, please. Sorry. Open discussion. Hell, if anybody wants to come up here, there's an extra mic, so, too. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, they, they do a lot of this stuff. You're required to have Windows Server classes. You're required to have a Linux administration class. You're required to have technical writing classes. Those are all piled into the Cambridge Breeze track. Yeah. You can have focus groups like what I see if you want to do the Windows Server more, but you still, you're, you're not getting away from these things. So I, I see, you know, looking back at what I did, how all these things play into what you guys are talking about. I mean, you take all of this, and you may, you may want to focus on one over the other because that's what you like more, but you're still going to have to take those classes and you're going to have to learn those other skills because, you know, working in security like I do, you, you, you have to work on everything. You have to have Linux skills. You have to have Windows skills. They're just requirements. And, and I'm, it, I'm starting to see some degree programs from other colleges, too, starting to pick up on that and actually start to blend those together. And I think and I hope going forward that we'll see that a lot more at universities Instead of, okay, well, you've got a, you know, a, a network administration or a network administrator here, you know, you've learned Windows the entire way through. Well, that's all fine, well, and dandy, but a lot of shops don't just have one single OS. I mean, it's, especially in security, you're going to be able to measure that. Absolutely. Um, how many students are here? Can, if you're a student, please raise your hand. And if you're also a professional, raise your other hand. If you're a student and professional, go like this. So. Um, I see a lot more students and uh, a small array of student and professionals in there. If you, the student professionals in the room, are you attaining masters, bachelors? Bachelors. 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 So you're working in the industry currently, looking and obtaining your bachelor's degree. Um, how many just peer professionals do we have in the room? Um, out of those peer professionals, how many of you guys do mentorship? Have somebody you directly work with right now? So three people, four. People, um, I think all of us could actually do a lot more than that, either it, by blogs or stepping up in the community, just in and of itself. Um, So, on top of that, Alistair, I've always thought, and, and it's not recommended very often for whatever reason, but taking a business administration class, just like a basics in business so you can teach the language of the business people you're working with, would be a great idea, and it's never included in the syllabus. I completely concur, concur with that. that. That should be something students should be learning, but that's all of it. Like, can you, can you, as a professional, can you step up and teach that to a kid, though? Would you be willing to include that in discussion at an InfoSec meetup? Um, you know what? We, you know, I, I recommended it to Bruce a couple years ago when he asked for what he wanted to teach. Uh, Bruce Schneier? Yeah. Or not, well, Bruce, Bruce Potter. Uh, Bruce Potter, right. And um, 
And everybody in the crowd said, he said, would you be interested in that? Everybody said, yeah. And yet nothing ever materialized. I think it's difficult to do in a, in a context like this because it's a lot of information. So did you guys know B-Sides is not actually an information security conference? Anybody actually, if you did know that, raise your hand. No? Okay, two people. Um, so B-Sides is actually a generalized conference. It's a, it's a conference which allows for any type of talk, any type of engagement. Um, you can... And it's going to be in the audience that's allowed to interact back with the speaker. Absolutely. So that's the concept of jacking others when they form the concept. So if you don't agree with what the speaker says or what they're talking about, call them out on it. That's absolutely. The concept. The problem with an open concert, with an open uh, conference, conference is session. exactly what happens with PangoCon. We get weird talks about furries, and that has happened. Well, <laughs> like people are in your position talking about how to be a furry. So I'm not going to discuss my opinions on furries. However, if that's your thing, then cheers to you, sir. Sorry, what was that? Was the suggestion that furries are the most appropriate Do you have personal experience? Are you sure? I just didn't want you to break the illusion that this is a security conference. No, it, it, but legitimately, the way b size was founded, this is not a security conference. This is an open conference that attracts security professionals. And that's how it should be. So if, if you have a talk on how to be a consultant, do it. Bring it out there because there are students coming to this group that don't know how to be a consultant, like myself two years ago, that I would have loved to hear about. So, uh, one of the things you mentioned was going to cons, mm -hmm. like DEF CON and BOG CON and all these different cons. And a perception of something like DEF CON is, you know, all the debauchery going to Bunny Ranch, getting drunk, and then maybe going to see a couple talks at PCM. As somebody who's looked into going to the Bunny Ranch from DEF CON, that is a hell of a long drive. <laughs> So you can't go to the Bunny Ranch with me next year? What's the, what, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, it's not Vegas. <laughs> you know, it always seems like, well, that's not my scene, right? You know, that's not, you know, as a professional, um, you know, I go back and I talk about ISO and SIM and all this great stuff, and I'm not, you know, popping penguins or boxes or, you know, belt face or anything. I hope you're not popping belt face. He's thumped next here. <laughs> Hello, if you want to pop him, I mean, well. so what's the, I mean, what do you accomplish when you go to DEF CON or BOG CON besides just getting drunk and, you know, talking That's actually people? a really valid question because a lot of conference scenes, there is a lot of drinking that occurs. And you know what? I mean, so it, 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 it happens. There's a lot of drunken debauchery that does happen. However, um, there are people who don't drink there and having the, the hallway con experience is, I think, really important. Um, you may not be interested in 92% of the talks, but you're going to meet somebody who knows something that you want to know, that has some experience or some business connection or some, what the fuck were you talking about there, buddy? Can we talk about this later? Cool. Yeah, th that, th that happens. And you find out about how to open prison doors remotely using SCADA, which is cool. And they did a talk on that in DC-19. Um, I went there. I attended a party. I met a guy who was standing out by a corner by himself because he was fantastically paranoid about anybody who approached him. So I just went up there and started smoking with his friend and started talking with him as he made way into the group. And lo and behold, he's the guy who developed the methodology and how to do that. And the next thing I know, his room's getting broken into and he needs bodyguards and is packing a gun. So I'm like, this guy's legit. This is craziness. But, um, you know, y you find people. Um, conferences are not always about the talk, but the, your fellow attendees, your, your speakers, your volunteers, the people who made this happen. And uh, a place like DEF CON, 20,000 people, it's hard to do. Going with a group of people, a lot more valuable. Going to a place like uh, a smaller conference like ThoughtCon or Nauticon, um, you're going to have possibly a lot more success, I think, uh, getting to know different people. DerbyCon, fantastic. I, I completely neglect to bring that up. Yes, DerbyCon's another place. But it, it's getting bigger, unfortunately, I think. It's, I think smaller cons are a lot more valuable. Well, the one thing you're going to find, too, is like, you're eventually going to get stuck with a crowd of people. You're going to know how many there. And there's people that you know who are saying they know something you don't. And the more people that you start to build in your network, the better you are going to be as a result. Absolutely. The hacker, the hacker culture built this professional industry we work in. Hacker culture is based upon freedom of information, sharing and, and interaction, participation and, and partnership. Uh, professionally, that's dying. 
that's a problem. We need to fix that. Well, uh, the rules of the, I mean, uh, I avoided going to 2600 because I'm out late, right? You know, I'm, I'm, I don't go to desk time because I'm out late. You know, I'm at a beach house, which is a little more professional, a little more local, a little bit, you know, less agoraphobic. Agor but, um, but I mean, it, there's always a sense of, you know, I'm not lead enough to hack into a box, but I'm not really cool enough to hang around any guys. Your skill set and your perspective, I'm not sure your experience, your knowledge or age, but there's somebody out there who doesn't know a quarter of what you know and they want to talk to you. And I'm not saying go out there and present yourself as an expert in everything, but do go out there and say, I know this stuff. I can talk. Be confident in yourself with that. And, and, and let me comment too, is I, I think that you know, a lot of these people, like I know Alex, I, he and I have conversations all the time, you know, and I'm impressed by his skills all the time. I don't know half of the information that you know, he does, but he's always been open to talking to me and listening to me. So I, I, that's one impression that I don't want people to have in the community is that they can't approach you. Raphael Mark, fantastic guy. You sit there and you can ask him any question. One of the most approachable people you know. And, you know, a lot of people consider him a rock star, but one of the nicest down to earth people you can meet. Absolutely. And, and Moe, on the same token, you yourself have a, a wealth of knowledge that you share with the community on a regular basis. You're one of those people I would say people should look to to learn how to just develop in that. Yeah. So, uh, for those who don't know, Security Moe actually helps, uh, organizes B-Side Chicago and is very directly involved in the Chicago security scene. Um, Absolutely. So I wrote a blog post uh, back in September about how slamming academia essentially and what it didn't, what it failed to produce or give me as a student. And I got a number of emails, Twitters, or tweets, um, Skype messages, people from my Skype channel. It's kind of creepy. Um, so the the thing is, nobody dissented. Everybody ag agreed. I call bullshit on that. Dissent with me. Disagree with me. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. I'm not an expert, I'm a professional. None of us are experts. We didn't write the books. We didn't develop this. So accept that. Take criticism, work with it. And give criticism back. Please tell me how I'm an asshole. I appreciate being told I'm an asshole. <laughs> But that comes with, uh, we're technical people, we're engineers, we're not social per se, but some of us are forced to do with our jobs. Um, I guess having these meetups really does help to have us engage and meet new people and get those contacts out there. So uh, the students in the crowd, it, what would you guys like to be learning in school? And uh, how do you, what do you think you could possibly not learn in school but learn in these meetups? 
what resources would you like to see show up these meetups, share their information, uh, and move forward from that? I'd like to see demos. See demos more so at these meetups, so more of a technical talk, and this is how it happens? Yeah. Okay. It, it just, again, hand up. You're not, you're not belt face. You don't have to do a dance. Just, just talk. I'm not going to dance for you. I'm not a white guy. Okay, but how? And, and having connections to professionals allows them better job opportunities as well. Please. Where at, out of curiosity? Fantastic. I have to tie every professional meeting, every curriculum to some grade. It's like students don't want to take the time or volunteer to come to stuff like that. I am happy to see some of my students here. <laughs> So here's, I, I actually did teach at Eastern Michigan for about, for a little while when I was there. Um, something I did is I made it not a requirement of the grade, but I made it extra credit. So one of the first assignments, week two of ethical hacking, I would say to my students, um, I want you to go out to a mall. I want you to pick somebody, and this could end poorly, please get waivers. Um, I want you to pick somebody and convince them that you know them that they know you, that you met them at a party, that you met them at a store, a bar, in a place, some event. And it, it's, that's SE Social Engineering 101. You walk up and say, hey, dude, it's been forever since I've seen you, et cetera. And I, I you know, 60, 70% of my students did it. It was fun. The stories, I wouldn't have them recorded. I wouldn't have them like, do anything creepy like audio, video, but I'd have them write about it. And so they may have been bullshitting me, but I got some really cool stories out of it from them. <laughs> and so, I mean, social engineering is a pretty critical skill. I've realized from being a consultant now that you need to learn how to read people's body language, their tone, how they're using certain words and inflections. And so uh, the more you push your students to do the social aspect of technical and, and information security, uh, the better off they are in the future, I think. professional and students going into the industry, because I've been on both sides. Um, you have to get used to not being the geek in the cave and, <laughs> and talk to people and, and express your ideas and not be so shy. And one of the things that I do is I make my students do a PowerPoint presentation where they have to go in front of the class at the end of the semester and present something. I have never seen so many people turn red, take <laughs> heed. I mean, they will do anything not to have to talk to people. We're all more dangerous. Yeah, but you can't be that way in this industry and be successful. No, in fact, I think Wired did an article in 2003 or 2004 where they stated that the future of, of technical is, is the information security, or the, the information people person. Mm -hmm. And that's when things started, did start to change. We were technical in context and resources had to be able to talk to customers. Because the sales guys, no offense to sales guys here, or sales engineers, or I love you all, you make me happy because you keep me in employed. But sales guys don't know what a pen test is most of the time. They don't know what ARP spoofing is, and you have to work with them, which is another conversation where technical researchers should be dealing with sales, but it's another story. Well, it was a couple of comments. When you were saying that you had to be a journalist, um, I'm not a journalist, but I could talk to an engineer. 
but that was because I'm a natural talker, and I can go up to almost anyone and talk to them, and I have gotten in places where I definitely am not supposed to be. And, uh, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. But the other part is the abuse of that, because of the fact that I know that I can do all these things, is you have to keep that line that you're not just doing this. You have to have a purpose for doing it and know that. Because I sometimes find myself talking to people, and I'm actually social engineer, and I'm like, okay, I just got this information, and said that, and I have to change the conversation. Because I'm like, they don't understand that they are giving me way too much information. You know, and That's a beautiful thing in the process. Right. Absolutely. So... Yes. All you can do is sit and work at a school. So it's harder sometimes to bridge the gap. You have to learn the business. You have to make sure you're invited to those meetings and that you're looked upon as another part of the business, not that you're IT and this is the business. Oh, that's the classic argument from the early 2000s where IT is a cost instead of a benefit. And now security is facing that same problem. And people much more experienced and better than I am have been talking about the James Arlen for example, uh, look him up if you haven't heard of him. Mercurial has been talking about this since uh, 2003, 2002, um, where he said, look, I, security is not a cost, but a benefit. It makes the company money, not cost it. A breach costs tens, if not hundreds, if not millions of dollars. Um, believe me, Spider Labs charges quite a bit to send one of our IR guys out there. And then there's the fines associated with it. So it, it's advantageous to invest in security, but we all know this. Right, and, that, and that's the business argument. Why can't, at the point, Jack, I'd like to say more at a personal level? Because when someone who's not IT walks in and sees an IT person, they see someone who serves the engineers and not the IT. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but, but that, and that's something that you can correct, and that's something that you have to, once you convince them that you're on their side, then you can have a productive conversation, but it's, it's, it's a rough way to go, and a lot of us, I get it comes from me, it's from, I'm, you know, from guys who do this for a little bit right now, and it's just, it's, it's, it's almost it's, like we have to recreate ourselves as IT people. The industry needs to change. Yeah. Yeah. We're no longer purely engineers, we're people. We're people engaging with other people, whether it be in our same business, our same unit, or other companies. Absolutely. So another thing that I would add is, is you know, something that I think is missing in our industry as a whole is just basic customer service skills. Mm. Uh, oh, everybody should work in a restaurant at least <laughs> once in their life. Work in retail. So, that's all right. I saw your hand up a bit. I, I, you didn't say anything. Go ahead, just speak up. But go ahead, yell over the crowd. It's okay. Okay. Uh, what, what's the benefit of a non-exempt? I mean, we can talk about um, the risk or the, the, the compromise that's been avoided. How do we know how to measure that? We need to talk about uh, security metrics, return on investment. Management loves to talk about um, risk in business terms in terms of how many dollars
Absolutely. So when I was in school, there was a concept I was taught called cost of compliance versus cost of non-compliance. This is one of the good things in business. One of the, the few business classes I was taught. Cost of compliance, we understand cost money. However, cost of non-compliance, you get pwned. I mean, high tech require, I mean, I think it's $10,000 per hour almost, depending on the size of your organization. If you get compromised for, for a healthcare environment. Uh, PCI, if you fail to comply, you can't process credit cards. Shit like that ends the business. But, but one so, one DT. One of the things I'm for, that, that's talking about the cost that it may cost them. Some businesses don't want to talk about that. But what's the value to the brand? Oh, uh, if, you can, if you can sell your company as more secure, when I have your data, your data is, you can trust me with your data. Then you can tell, then that business can then tell their clients that you're better off with us. Are you going to go to the brain surgeon who's the top of the field? You're going to find out who's the best kid. You're going to pay the money that he wants to charge you. The value of the brand then becomes an increase in their revenue. And you can show them that that's an actual marketing okay. you know, something they can bring to the table. So uh, just for curiosity, did you stop using uh, a bank because they got compromised? I mean, Bank of America has gotten compromised how many times in the past five years? They don't leave them. The customers don't leave because of that. I, I understand that... To us, yes, that's valuable. I'm a little bit more cautious about where I use my credit card or my debit card. I, I look for skimmers, um, but day to day, I'm not, I, value wise, saying we're secure, I find that at the bottom of the web page, not the top. And yeah, and it's unfortunate. Good call out on that one. That was a local event too, right? Yeah. Sorry. Did it? Uh, okay. And that, that's a good thing that companies are required to do now. They have to. They, ten years ago, they didn't have to, but ten years ago, we had open Wi-Fi networks with cardholder data being processed across the same net, and that was fun. Well, uh, not that I did that. <laughs> so um, the other, uh, just security to a to a customer is it important? I'm not sure. To a company, absolutely, because the fines they could find them out of existence. Small businesses, medium-sized businesses could go away instantaneously. Uh, DT, you had a comment earlier. You had your hand up. I completely agree. Now, um, my experience is different from a lot of different people going into consulting, but I think the pen testing world is very different from other consultants. Um, I was uh, hired in, and what occurred is I was assigned my client on my third week, and I was put into a kickoff call. I was the one talking in the kickoff call, not the senior consultant listening, and then I was given notes afterwards. Nobody held my hand. I had to figure it out as I went. It was, you know, swim or die. And I think consultants should, if you're going to the pen testing world, you should definitely be given a couple months lead, a book, a cleaning class, something, shadow somebody, so you aren't just thrown to the wolves. And, you know, if your first client happens to be an asshole, well, I mean, you're kind of screwed because then you've got a bare taste in your mouth and don't know what to do. Um, but if you're lucky and your first client's awesome and he's willing to be like, yeah, dude, you totally hacked my shit. That was awesome. Now give me the report. So, uh, so yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that in a louder voice? I think what you had to say was valuable, but I could. Barely hear it. There's a big difference between guidance and coddling, too. You know, there's a lot of different types of personalities that have to have the right person to run guidance. And you know, you can't expect to 
to have his own help all the time. That's what's going to make him successful in that business for all the rest of his life. Agree. So I just got the uh, time sign. Any any comments from anybody else here? Please stop raising your hand. Say something. Just <laughs> hey, stand up. Come on, up. I'm gonna make you dance. You, look, belt face is in here. Nice dance. Cool. Every single meeting, I am the first person that they try, they try to get input from me and every single aspect of what they're talking about. I think that's a pretty unique aspect of some places that you work because that way it forces you to become comfortable around the people you're working with and it instantly causes you to use business terms and learn the lingo of everyone around you because, you know, if you speak the way they speak, then they'll understand you a lot quicker. Uh, when you're starting off, you're trying to you know, have a conversation and you're trying to use the verbiage that everyone else uses. Even if it's a mistake, that way they can give you that, that feedback instantly and say, you know, we're well, trying to talk about this. If you were, this is the kind of this is what we say in that regard. So this is what we say in that, you know. Depending on what topic is, every single person in the room, like you said, is an expert on what they they know. And then starting as a professional, you don't know much. You know what you know, but you want to learn what everyone else knows because that way you can find what you like and then you become an expert in that particular thing. And I think pushing those people who have been in there for 10 years that aren't exactly... Like, um, I, I'm sorry to call you out, I don't even know you, but you said you don't feel comfortable going to like MI20 Center or DEF CON or something like that and speaking up and saying something, but, you know, I don't know what you know, but I probably could learn a lot. So, that's a perspective you should have in somebody who's new in the industry like myself. It, look at somebody else and say, you know, you're new, let me help you. Absolutely. So, um, got a sorry. Panel time. Panel time. Yes. So, thank you guys. I appreciate it.